Today is the SAT Math Strategies Workshop that I am offering in partnership with the Safety Harbor Public Library. If you don't already know me, my name is Carla Berry and I offer SAT prep and ACT prep. I also help students prepare their college applications and personal statements. And this is what I do full time. So I particularly enjoy the SAT and the questions that we are are looking at today, I am especially excited about because they can all be answered using SAT specific strategies. So for a lot of questions on the SAT, there will be a long way and a quick way to get to the answer. And today we're going to be focusing on those quick ways. So if you learned a longer way in school, you can still use it, but you may not have enough time on test day to utilize that longer method. So it doesn't go to say that the longer method is wrong, but we do wanna be time efficient <laughs> on the SAT. If you at any point want to check with me if your alternate method does work, just send me a message in the chat and I will try to address that for you. If we do have time to look at multiple methods to answer a question, we will do that also. And for any question that we're going to look at how to solve in the graphing calculator today, we're also going to look at how to solve without a graphing calculator. That is a request that I received in the past from students that struggle struggled with not having access to a graphing calculator. So I want to make sure that I cover it both ways for today's workshop. So let me see, I do have a couple of questions. Um, and I just want to make sure that there's nothing that needs to be answered before we get started. And let's see here. So I do have two students that had a hard time getting in to the meeting. So I am just going to reshare the link with them and then we will dive into the first question. If anyone did not receive an email from me today with the workshop materials, please send me a message in the chat so that I can also give you access to that email because that's going to be important for you too. I'm just gonna take one second here. And let me actually, I will just put the link to the email in the chat box and send that in the message to the two students who are having a hard time getting in. two more seconds. And if anyone else is unable to join, they will still have access to the reporting. Okay, so let's dive on in. So I did share the link to the email that I sent out with the workshop materials. You'll see two things in that email the core concepts and critical thinking skills handout and the math strategies worksheet. So we are mainly going to be focusing on the math strategies worksheet today, and we may reference the core concepts and critical thinking skills as needed. So just so that you know, let's start with just briefly looking at the core concepts and critical thinking skills. Because as I remember from the poll that we did earlier, we have about a 50-50 split for students that know me and have had workshops or boot camps with me in the past and students that are brand new to this. So the core concepts and critical thinking skills is one handout that I use with students to prepare for the SAT. Everything contained in this handout you absolutely need to know in order to do well 
On the SAT, there is absolutely nothing in here that is optional or busy work. I always tell students that my worst nightmare would be on test day for all of this information to just evaporate from my memory. You definitely will be utilizing all of this. So the first page of the core concepts handout is just basic test taking strategies. The next page is half reading strategy and half writing and language strategy. And then the last page front and back is math strategy. So we will be looking at a couple of these concepts today. I really encourage you to also read through this on your own and perhaps looking at an SAT bootcamp that I offered earlier this year, just so that you can become really comfortable with these concepts if you have never had a course or a bootcamp or workshop pertaining just to the core concepts with me in the past. So let's dive on into the SAT math strategies handout. So in here, I have pulled questions from real practice tests from the College Board. So the College Board has practice tests one through 10 that they have released to students to practice with to prepare for the SAT. Those tests are usually ones that were actually administered to students. So they are real questions and they're really indicative of what you're going to see on test day. Before I have students practice using test questions from test prep companies that come up with their own questions, I always encourage them to first work at a minimum through the 10 practice tests released from the College Board, those are going to give you the best preparation. If you are practicing using Khan Academy, I would really want to encourage you to print some practice tests too and actually take the test using pencil and paper because showing your work on paper has been shown to improve students results on test day. So it's not the best practice to only work through those questions on your computer screen. I want you to actually physically work through them too. So the first question we have here is from the no calculator section from test one. It's question number six. And we see an equation there, h equals 3a plus 28.6. And when we read this question, we're going to have to identify what information do they want us to find? That's going to be the number one thing that we are looking for. But before I even read that question, I'm already paying attention to this equation. Can anyone tell me what kind of equation that is in the chat? Does anyone know? Let me see here. So Catherine says slope intercept form. Nikki says linear. Alexandra says linear. And yes, this is just y equals mx plus b. And it's actually part of the core concepts. And if you can recognize something as being in the form of y equals mx plus b on the SAT, you are already halfway to getting the right answer in record time. <laughs> so they give us a bunch of information there, right? But at the very end is the actual question. And the question part is the part that we want to zoom in and focus on. So it says, based on the model, what is the estimated increase in inches of a, of a boy's height each year? So is an estimated increase going to be the slope or the y-intercept? Who knows? That's going to be the slope or the y-intercept. So estimated increase is SAT code or SAT language referencing either the slope or the y-intercept. So Nikki says slope, Catherine says slope, Lydia says slope, Austin says slope. So everyone's saying slope so far, so that's great. And it is in fact the slope. That's all they're interested in. So when we're looking at that equation, we just wanna zoom in on the slope and that's going to be the coefficient of x. And in this case, that's just going to be three. And that's all you have to do for this question. 
notice that I didn't even need to read the part of this question that came before. I didn't even need to know that it was about a pediatrician using this model to estimate the height of a boy in inches in terms of the boy's age, A in years, between the ages of two and five. This does not mean that on test day, I want you to not read <laughs> the questions. I just want you to know which part is actually important and what is the part that you want to focus on. If I read the last part of that question that I have highlighted in blue there, and I wasn't really sure what they were looking for, and I looked at the equation and I was still a little bit confused, then I would go back earlier and really read that in detail. But if I read that last part and it makes perfect sense and I already recognize that this is just y equals mx plus b, I can feel comfortable just pulling out that three as my slope and moving on. So let's see here. Let's move on actually to the next question. And this is gonna be question number 10, which is also from test number one. So it is possible to solve this question in under 20 seconds without doing any algebra. And I'm gonna give everyone a chance to do that before we look at it to see if you can figure it out. Okay, if you think you have the answer, let me know in the chat for number 10. And then we'll look at how to get that answer both in a quick way and in a longer algebraic way. So Arnie says A, Nikki also says A, and A in fact is the correct answer. Question number 10 is the perfect illustration from the core concepts for thinking before you jump in. So on the SAT, it's really advantageous to pause and think and really consider the information before you do a lot of work. It doesn't mean that you're never going to have to do a lot of work, but sometimes if we just pause and stop to think about what is the information given and how are we using that information, we can avoid a lot of work. So in this case, when we look at this question, we have g of x equals ax squared plus 24. For the function g defined above, a is a constant and g of 4 equals 8. What is the value of g of negative 4? Well, g of 4 equals 8 just means that when um, we plug in x, it's equal to y. I hope that's clear to everyone. So when x equals 4, y or g of x equals 8. So let's see where we're plugging in that 4 for x. We would plug it in right here. And notice that we're squaring the four and four squared equals positive 16. Negative four squared also equals positive 16. That is why for both g of four, um, g of x will equal eight. And for g of negative four, g of x will also equal eight. Let's say that wasn't obvious to you when you paused and thought about it. If it wasn't obvious to you, you would actually have to solve for A, which is the constant there, and then go and solve for G of negative four. So let's see what that looks like. We would say that G of X equals AX squared plus 24. So I am just rewriting the given information. And they told us that G of four equals eight. So I can say that eight 
equals a times 4 squared plus 24. So 8 equals 16a plus 24. After I subtract 24 from both sides, I get negative 16 equals 16a. So negative 1 equals a. Now I know what a is equal to, and I can rewrite that equation using that negative 1 for a. So g of x equals negative x squared plus 24. So we're just making a equal to negative 1. And we want to find what is g of negative 4. That was the actual part of the question we were looking for. What is the value of g of negative 4? So I'm just going to plug in that negative 4 for x. Whenever you plug in a number for x, make sure that you put it into per parentheses and you square the whole thing. So in this case, it's super important that we're also squaring that negative and we're not just squaring the four because a negative times a negative gives us a positive. So plus 24 here and then we get negative 16 because we have positive 16 times negative one plus 24 and that equals eight. And that's our final answer. But notice how much faster this question was. It was a 20 second question, maybe a 30 second question. If we stopped and actually thought about, hey, what are we doing with that four? We're just squaring it. So it doesn't matter if the four is positive or negative, it's going to equal the same number. It's going to equal eight. Let's go on to number 20 from the no calculator section from test two. If you have this worksheet printed out, I want you to give this question a triple star because you are pretty much guaranteed to see it on test day with, if you're taking the SAT. All of the questions in this worksheet are very prevalent <laughs> on the SAT. I purposefully chose them because they're questions that reappear all the time. But number 20 is special because it's kind of complicated and the SAT considers it to be a more advanced math question type. And if you don't know the method that I use to solve this question, it could take a long time, which I don't recommend. It can get really confusing. But if you know this method and you feel comfortable applying it, this question becomes a 20, 30 second question maximum. So I'm going to give you just 30 seconds <laughs> to see if you can solve this question on your own. And then we're going to look at it together. And I'm just going to count to 30 in my head. Okay, does anyone have the answer to number 20? You can send it to me in the chat box if you do. So Catherine says one fourth, that is correct. Did anyone else get one fourth? You can just raise your hand if you did. So I see a couple of hands for one fourth. So realistically on test day, this is what my question is going to look like or my piece of paper is going to look like. I would underline infinitely many solutions and I would say, hey, that means same slope, same y-intercept and same line. It's just one line on top of another line. So that means the equations that they gave us are equal to each other. And they're interested in A over B. And A and B are my X and Y coefficients. So they deal with the slope. So I'm not concerned about my Y intercepts. I would just cross those out. And then it becomes clear that A equals two and B equals eight. So A over B equals two over eight equals one fourth. Now that is how you solve it in 20 to 30 seconds. 
before you get to the point to feel confident to solve it in this way, you do need to be familiar with these two core concepts. So first core concept is the standard form for the equation for a line, which is ax plus by equals c. And to know that the slope comes from the x and y coefficients, you can see down here that the slope is negative a over b and the y-intercept is c over b. It's not important to remember, hey, it's negative a over b or that the y-intercept is c over b, that's not the most important part here. The most important part here is to know that the slope relates to the x and y coefficients. Another thing that we're using from the core concepts handout is no solution versus infinite solutions. So that question said that there were infinitely many solutions. So that triggered in my mind, hey, this is the same line. So they're going to have the same slope and the same y-intercept. And in that question, remember that they said they wanted A over B. And I can see from those equations that are written in standard form that A and B are just my X and my Y coefficients. So I am concerned with my slope and that's why I could comfortably just cross out my Y intercepts and not worry about them or the numbers that would later on become my y-intercepts and they just get one fourth. You are pretty much guaranteed to see a question like number 20 on the SAT. And it's really interesting to me that questions that are hard don't necessarily take a long time to solve. It's just conceptually harder and it can be intimidating if you don't know these rules. But if you do know these rules, they become super easy to solve quickly. Let's look at test number seven, um, question 11. So the expression, and I'm not even going to read out that <laughs> expression um, where X is greater than one and Y is greater than one is equivalent to which of the following. So I'm gonna give everyone just 30 seconds to see if you can find the answer. And then we're gonna look at how do you get the answer in 30 seconds. Okay, if anyone has the answers, send it to me in the chat box. So I see a couple already said, D and D, and that's the correct answer. So let's look here. So instead of changing all of the x to the negative two power and the y to the half power and x to the one third and y to the negative one power. Instead of simplifying all of those, I can just zoom in on one of them and see if it helps me pick the right answer. Let's say that I just zoomed in on this x to the one third. That's going to be equivalent to the cube root of x. So I'm looking for the cube root of x in the answers, and that only occurs in answer choice D. So just by zooming in on one part, we can pick the right answer. This also relates to the core concepts back page for math for exponent rules. And you 100% need to know all of these for test day. Notice that whenever we have an exponent that is negative, if we move it to the denominator, it changes to a positive exponent. Likewise, if we had a negative exponent in the denominator, if we moved it back up to the numerator, it would switch to positive. So let's look at the other ones in here too. So x to the negative 2 power would equal 1 over positive x to the 
positive two power. So we're looking for x squared in the denominator. And that also occurs in answer choice D. We have y to the one half power here. That's just going to be equal to the square root of y. And that occurs here. And then for the y to the negative one power that's in the denominator there, remember that when I move that y to the negative one to the numerator, it becomes positive, right? It just becomes y. y to the one is equal to y. And that we also have here in D. If anyone has questions as we work through these problems, please let me know in the chat box. And I just noticed a question relating to the previous problem, number 20. Why doesn't the number in the equation matter? So I hope I clarified that that 12 and the 60 don't matter because they relate to the y-intercepts. And the question asks for the value of a over b, which only relates to the slope. Um, so that's why we're only concerned with the x and the y coefficients and the y-intercepts here don't matter. Okay, so let's go on to test three, number three, which of the following is equal to a to the two thirds for all values of a. And once you get the answer here, just send it to me in the chat box. This should be a five to 10 second question on test day. The answer is D. So we're gonna use a rule that comes from the core concepts exponent rules that when we have X to the A over B, that's going to equal the B root of X to the A power. The way that you can remember this is that the exponent stays the exponent. It doesn't become the root. And whatever number that's in the denominator here becomes the root. So if we look at a to the 2 thirds power, 3 is in the denominator there. So that's the root that we're looking for. We're looking for the cube root. And we have 2 in the numerator there. So we're looking for a squared. So the answer is d. Any questions on that, just let me know in the chat box. Let's look at question number three from test eight. The formula below is often used by project managers to compute E, the estimated time to complete a job, where O is the shortest completion time, P is the longest completion time, and M is the most likely completion time. Then they give us an equation. Which of the following correctly gives P in terms of E, O, and M? Realistically, I didn't need to read any of that to know what to do here because they gave me an equation. And then I can see that all my answer choices are P equal to something. So that tells me that I need to solve for P here. I need to isolate it. And I am going to give you guys just 20 seconds to see if you get the answer. Once you have an answer that you feel comfortable with, send it to me in the chat box. Good, I already see one correct answer. a couple more. So when we want to get P by itself, the first thing that I would want to do here is clear the fraction. That means that I want to multiply both sides of the equation by 6. That's going to give me 6E equals O plus 4M 
plus P. It cancels the six in the denominator on the right-hand side, and I need to multiply my left-hand side by the six too. That's how I get the six E equals O plus four M plus P. Remember that I'm solving for P. So at this point, I'm just going to subtract my O and my four M, and that gives me P by itself, which is equal to answer choice A. Let's look at question number nine. And again, this question can, much like all of the questions that we're looking at today, I should probably stop saying it so that I'm not being redundant. Um, but basically everything we're looking at today can be solved in about 30 seconds. Maybe there's some that take slightly more time, but for the most part, 30 seconds. Um, somebody asked, how can you tell O from zero? Basically here in the answer, not in the answer, in the question where they say O is the shortest completion time, they're telling you it's a variable. So if you actually read the question, it would tell you, hey, this is a variable. It's not zero is the shortest completion time. So good number nine. I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds to tell me what letter is the correct answer choice and then we're going to look at this question together too. Okay, so let's first look at um, how not to answer this question. If you started answering this question by squaring both sides here to get rid of that radical and you got X minus A equals X squared minus eight X plus 16. And then you went ahead and plugged in the two for A and you had x minus two equals x squared minus eight x plus 16, and you were attempting to solve for x, you were doing way too much work for this question because they already gave you the options for your answers in the answer choices. So there's no need to be going through all that algebra. Instead of actually solving for x, we're just gonna look at that question. And there are two cases where we have to be really careful for the careful about the domain on the SAT. Whenever we see a variable in the denominator of a fraction, so let's say I had one over X minus two, I would know that X cannot equal positive two because that would be two minus two, which is zero. And I cannot divide by zero. That would not work. <laughs> so another case for looking at the domain would be whenever I have a radical and even root and I have a variable on the inside, as long as that radical is there, it needs to be equal to a positive number. And this is what I'm actually gonna use to solve this question. They wanna know what is the solution set of the equation above. So I'm gonna take each of these and just plug it in for X on the right-hand side to make sure that this all equals a positive number. Three minus four equals negative one. So X cannot equal three. Six minus four equals positive two. So X could equal six. 2 minus 4 
gives me negative two. So two doesn't work. We already eliminated three. So the answer here has to be D. So remember that radical X or a even root of any radical expression has to be equal to a positive number for question like number nine. Let's look at question number 19 from test 10. And I am going to give you 20 seconds to answer this question. And if at any point you do have a question, instead of raising your hand, please send me a message in the chat box. So I already see a couple of correct answers for this. So for systems of equations on the SAT, we generally want to use substitution or elimination. But for this question, we have an important clue. We are in the no calculator section and they're asking for 5x plus 5y. They are not simply asking me to solve for x or y by itself. If they were asking for X or Y by itself, it would be more likely that I would need to use substitution or elimination. But on the SAT, whenever they ask you for a combination of variables, usually you are first going to want to try to see what happens when you simply add the equations together or you subtract one equation from the other equation. So in this case, we're just gonna draw a line and we're gonna add the two equations and that's gonna give us 5x plus 5y equals 2,500 and 2,500 is our answer. This is question number 19 in a no calculator section. There are only 20 questions in the no calculator section and they go in order from easy to medium to hard and as soon as you get to the free response questions, they reset in difficulty. So it goes easy, medium, hard again. So the second to last free response question, number 19 in the no calculator section, is considered to be more advanced and pretty hard. And all you had to do here is add the two equations together. And that is why it's so important before you dive into a question and you utilize your strategies that you maybe needed to use in school on math tests to think about what could you do to get to the answer in a faster way and think about it as the SAT. This is a critical thinking test. It's a reasoning test. So it rewards students that pause and use their brains to think about a faster strategy to get to the right answer. Okay, let's look at the next page here. Test one, number six, and this is in the calculator section. And for any conversion question on the SAT, I want you to remember to show your work. So I have been working in the test prep industry for over 10 years. I have helped a ton of students prepare for the SAT. And for about the first eight years, I didn't see students have a major issue with questions dealing with conversions. But over the last couple of months, maybe the last year or two, I have noticed that students are more and more uncomfortable with conversions and that students often fall into the trap of going directly in their calculators instead of showing their work on paper and setting up those equations and then they make silly mistakes and they're pretty much just giving away points, which is not what I want you to do on test day. I don't want you to give away any points. You get the exact same point for an easy question as a medium question, as a hard question, and no one is ever going to know were you solving the easy questions or the medium questions or the hard questions. So even for an easier conversion question, I still want you to show all of your work. So I'm going to give you just a minute to solve this question. And once you have the answer, you can put it in the chat box and we'll look at it together.
Okay, so I'm seeing a couple of right answers. The correct answer here is D. And let's think about how we're going to get there. So they say based on the information given in the box above, how many one milligram doses are there in one two decagram container? So they wanna go from two decagrams two milligrams. And I like writing that down on my piece of paper to begin with so that I remember what am I looking for here. So I'm going to write out the given information first, the two decagrams. And then I'm going to open up parentheses for my conversion factor. You may have done this in chemistry if you learned about dimensional analysis, like Catherine just mentioned, or you maybe learned this in math, or maybe you never learned this before in school, and that's okay too. I always use conversion factors because that enables me to make sure that I am eliminating the right units and that I am ending up with the unit that they are asking for. So I want to get rid of decagrams. So I'm going to write decagrams in the denominator here so that I can cancel them out. And then I'm referring to the given information up here to see that one decagram equals 10 grams. So that's what I'm going to start with. But they didn't ask for grams, they asked for milligrams. So I need to do another conversion. And I know grams needs to go in the denominator here so that I can cancel out those grams, like so. And I'm looking back at that little box there and I can see one gram is equal to 1000 milligrams. So once I have this all set up, I want to make sure that the unit that I'm left with is the unit that they asked for and that it's in the right spot. In this case, I want it to be in the numerator. So I know milligrams is a unit that I am left with and it's great. I am ready to go. Now in your calculator or in your head, you would just do two times 10 times 1000 2 times 10 is 20. So we have 20 times 1,000, which is just 20,000. And that's your final answer here. Unfortunately, there are no shortcuts for a dimensional analysis. There can still be pretty fast questions, but I see students all the time give away valuable points by rushing through dimensional analysis, conversion question types, and not showing their work when they need to. Okay, so for number 21, I see there's a table. Who here knows the most important rule for questions relating to tables on the SAT? And it's not a fancy mathematical rule, it's pretty basic. <laughs> And I'm curious if anyone knows what the rule is. I don't see any responses here. I see one read. That's actually not it. So the number one thing that you need to keep in mind for tables on the SAT is to write on the table. I want you to circle, annotate that table. If I am looking at a student's piece of paper and it's a question relating to a table that they're working on and I don't see any annotations on that table, nothing is circled, the table is just appearing the exact way um, that it did when the student was first handed the test, it's completely untouched. I am already thinking, you know what, they probably didn't get this question right. So we need to be really careful with tables and we want to make sure that we're writing on the table, we're drawing on it, we're circling, we're labeling. So as we read this question, it says the data in the table above were produced by sleep researchers studying the number of dreams people recall when asked to record their dreams for one week. Group X consisted of 100 people who observed early bedtimes. So I'm going to label group X here as early. I'm going to write it next to group X so that I don't have to make that connection again later. 
And then it says group Y consisted of 100 people who observed later bedtimes. So group Y is later. And here comes the question. So we really want to pay attention to the last part of the question where they actually ask you to identify information. This is the most important part. If a person is chosen at random from those who recalled at least one dream. So we are not choosing someone from ran someone randomly from everyone. We are not concerned about this grand total over here. We are not concerned about people who recalled no dreams. We're not concerned about that. We are only concerned about people who recalled at least one dream. So that would be the people who recalled one to four dreams or five or more. And you would circle that or box it in in a way so that you know that's the part of the table that you actually need to answer this question. And they want to know what is the probability that the person belonged to group Y. So I am going to circle group Y. And we know that for probability, it's going to be the desired outcomes over the total. And the desired outcomes is for group Y, and that's just 11 plus 68. And the total outcomes is down here. That's our total. So our total is 39 plus 125, and that's going to give us 79 over 164, which is answer choice C. It's extremely important for tables. Make note of it now that you want to write on your table and that you actively want to cross out information that you don't need and circle the information that you're going to use. Don't fear crossing out information on the SAT. If you find later that you need it and you cross something out that you shouldn't have, you can always go back and erase and see what you crossed out. We are not taking the SAT using pens, so you can totally cross something out if you don't wanna be distracted by it and you wanna prevent yourself from accidentally picking that answer later on. For number 28, let's do a raise of hands if anyone wants to attempt 28 before we look at it together. So if you'd like to first attempt 28, just raise your hand. Only see a couple of hands. So I'm going to give the two people that raised their hands or three people. Let's see what would be a reasonable amount of time. They give you 30 seconds to attempt this question before we look at it together. Okay, so this question appears in the calculator section of the SAT and our graphing calculators can actually solve it. With a raise of hands, does anyone know how to graph inequalities in their calculators? So just raise your hand if you know how to graph inequalities in the calculator. So I see a couple of hands, not a ton of hands. Okay. So let's first look, how are we going to graph this without a graphing calculator? Luckily, both of our equations are in the y equals mx plus b form. So I would first go find my y-intercept here, which is positive 1. Let's actually do this in a color so it's a little bit clear. Positive 1 is my y-intercept, and I can see that it's a positive slope. So I'm just going to draw a line like so. I'm not going to try to be super exact with this. 
And then for my second equation, I can see that I also have a positive slope. It's one over two, and I have a y-intercept of negative one. So we'll make this our green line. How about that? So I'm gonna go to negative one and it's going to be up one over two. So I'm going to have a line that looks a little bit more like that for the slope. And because it says greater than, we actually want to make that line dotted because it doesn't include the line. This first equation was greater than or equal to, so we needed to have a solid line. Now I need to figure out how am I going to shade? And for that, I'm going to plug in zero, zero. That is my key to shading. So for the first equation, when y is zero and x is zero, we have zero is greater than or equal to one. Oops, let's see here. And that is not true, right? We could say not true. That means we don't want to shade zero, zero. We don't want to shade the origin. So when we're shading this, we're shading away from the origin. We're going to shade up like so. Let's do the same thing for the second equation. Is zero greater than zero minus one? That is true, right? So for that equation, I do want to shade zero. So that part needs to be shaded. And I'm going to have to shade up again. My solution for this inequality is where the shading overlaps. And I can see in quadrant four, there is no overlap. So that means quadrant four has no solutions. Now I could also have my calculator graph this and let's look at how we would do that. And I just need to open up my calculator here on my computer so that I can easily share it. And someone said that they need to leave. Will they be able to access a recording of this? And you should be able to, barring any technical difficulties. And I'm just going to share my calculator here. So you should all be able to see my calculator. Let me make my calculator a little bit bigger. So I am going to go to apps and then go down to in equals and press enter. And my in equals is already turned on. So I would just say continue. Let me quit it just so that you can see what it looks like when I turn it on. I would go to apps and then go down to in equals. And it's kind of anticlimactic when I turn it on. It's on now, but it's as if nothing really happened. It just takes me to the y equals part of my calculator. But once I've turned on in equals, I can actually go to the left here until this flickering box appears. And when I press enter, I can change that equal sign to an inequality symbol. So for this question, I need a greater than or equal to symbol. And I'm going to have y is greater than or equal to 2x plus 1. And for my second equation, y is greater than half x plus, minus 1. So greater than half x minus one, and then I'm just going to graph that. You can see my calculator graphs and shades it for me, which is a lot faster and more accurate, I'd even say, than doing this by hand because your calculator doesn't make silly mistakes, but we sometimes do. And I can see here that my fourth quadrant is empty, so that is where there would be no solutions for the system of inequalities. Personally, I like turning off inequals last time, obviously I forgot to do so, but I do prefer to turn it off so that I don't have to go back and change those inequality symbols back to equal signs for future problems. So I'm just going to say quit inequality graphing. And if I went back to y equals here and I went to the left, you can see how that big box that flickers doesn't appear because in equals is now turned off. And that's it for that question. Let's go on to another one. 
And question number 30 here, I'd say is at maximum a 20 second question, probably a 15 second one. So once you have the answer, I want you to send it to me in the chat box. I see a couple of answers so far. I give you guys 10 more seconds. So this question actually relates to the core concepts. They give us a parabola here. We can see we have this parabola. They give us an equation to this parabola. Can anyone tell me what form that equation is in? There are three forms of a parabola that we're gonna see on the SAT. And I wanna know what is the form of that equation? What special information is it giving me? Guys may, oh, I got one from Catherine. So it's a y-intercept form, whoops. And that is correct. And when I read this question, they say, which of the following is an equivalent form of the equation of the graph shown in the XY plane above from which the coordinates of the vertex can be identified as constants in the equation. So I want an equation that is in vertex form. Now, luckily for this question, there's only one answer choice in vertex form. Our first two answer choices are in X intercept form x equals negative 3 would be one x-intercept, and x equals 5 would be the other x-intercept. x-intercept form is the quadratic factored. So that's how you can spot it. Insert choice C is no form in particular, at least that I'm aware of. That is just an outlier answer that's there to throw you off a little bit. And insert choice D is in the vertex form. And if we go look at our core concepts, the parabolas are extremely important for you to know for test day. So we have the three forms of a parabola there. The vertex form is something in parentheses squared and then plus the constant. That constant can be positive or negative. The y-intercept form is the basic form of a quadratic that I'm sure you're all pretty used to seeing, ax squared plus bx plus c. And then the x-intercept form is just that factored form. So we can see here that there's only one answer choice here that's in the vertex form that has something factored and then a constant on the outside. So the answer here has to be D, which is why this is a 20 second question. If you know how to identify the x-intercept form, the y-intercept form, and the vertex form. Now let's say more than one answer choice here was in the vertex form and that was not sufficient to just be able to identify, hey, vertex form to get to the answer. In that case, we would need to complete the square to switch it from y-intercept form to vertex form. And because quite a few of you said that you were aiming to score above a 700 on the SAT, you would need to know how to complete the square in order to accomplish that goal. So we're going to take y equals x squared minus 2x minus 15. And then we're going to leave a space to complete the square there. We're going to take half of that 2 and square it. So half of negative 2 is negative 1. Negative 1 squared is positive 1. But remember that I cannot simply just add a 1 to an equation. That's not allowed. So I'm going to have to subtract a 1 also. And this is going to give me a perfect square right here, x minus 1 squared. And in the outside of the parentheses, I'm going to get negative 15 minus 1, which is negative 16. So let's see here. And that would be d x minus 1 squared 
minus 16. And Catherine asks, um, which would be the correct x-intercept form? So out of these two, the correct inter correct x-intercept form would be a x plus three times x minus five. You wanna switch the sign of the x-intercepts when they're factored. So that would be the correct x-intercept form. Number 28, I'm going to give you all 30 seconds to attempt on your own before we look at it together. Okay, if anyone has the answer to this one, let me know in the chat. Let's see one answer so far. It's not the right answer though. Give you guys a couple more seconds. Raise your hand if you want just a little bit more time to try to solve this on your own. We see a couple of hands, so I'm gonna give you a little bit more time. Ah, someone's on the right track. Okay, let's look at this question because I don't want to waste too much time on it and have you answer this using the long way. So what the College Board wants you to do is not what I want you to do for this question. If you looked up the solution for this question from the College Board, it would most likely say that you should label C and E. So you would label these two points because they gave you C and E in the question. And then you would find the equation of that line and you would see what is the slope um, between C and E. And then you would find the slope that is perpendicular to that slope to find the slope for the line that forms B to D when we connect those two. And then you would use y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 to finally find the equation that goes from b to d. But that's a lot of work and it's not realistic for test day. Rarely you will be required to go through those steps for a question. But before you do that for any type of graphing problem, I want you to remember to write on your graph. And also remember that it's the last part of the question here that's actually important. For dramatic effect, I'm going to erase the first part because it really doesn't matter. All that matters is that they are asking us hey, which of the following is an equation of the line that passes through points B and D? So I am going to connect points B and D. On test day, when you're connecting points, it's extremely important to be as straight as possible with your line. So make sure that you're using your Scantron as a ruler if you tend to draw wobbly lines like so. And we're going to think about just why equals mx plus b. We're looking for our slope and our y-intercept. 
and we can see the line that we just drew has a negative slope. But we have a problem. All of these answer choices have negative slopes, so that doesn't help us much. But we can also see that our y-intercept is over here between two and four. So our y-intercept is positive. So our y-intercept cannot be negative one, and it also can't be positive four, that's too big. So our answer here has to be B. And if we distributed that negative three, we would get Y equals negative three X plus three. And we have our negative slope and we have our positive three Y intercept and three is between two and four. And that's just so much faster than going through the process of finding the slope between point C and E, and then using the negative reciprocal for the perpendicular slope, and using y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, going through coordinate E to find the equation of the line that connects points B and D. Okay, that was a mouthful. Test eight, number 14, which of the following is a value of X for which the expression is undefined? And I'm going to give you guys just 30 seconds to attempt this question. So someone asked if the recording will be on my YouTube channel and I will be uploading it there. So I already see a couple of right answers. So let's just dive on in here. So it asks us, when is this undefined? It's undefined when the denominator equals zero. Remember earlier I said, whenever you have an even root, you want it equal to a positive number and we don't ever want to divide by zero. So we need to see what number for X would make our denominator zero. So we're going to say that X squared plus three X minus 10 equals zero. And then we're going to factor that to solve for X. So X times X gives me X squared. And then I have to think about what two numbers multiply together to give me negative 10 and add together to give me positive three. And that's going to be five minus two. So X plus five times X minus two. So I'm gonna have X plus five equals zero. So X equals negative five. That's not an answer choice. And I also have X minus two equals zero. So X equals positive two. So D is the correct answer there. We could have, instead of factoring here, just plugged in those answer choices in the denominator. We can also use an app on our calculators if you have the TI-80 form called PolySmelt. And we can just plug in the equation, the denominator into that. So I'm gonna go to apps and then go down to PolySmelt, polynomial root finder. My order is two, because this is a quadratic. I have X squared. I want real solutions and the rest I'm gonna leave alone. Auto normal flow degree. To go next, you press the graph button. And I'm gonna press zoom. It's the middle button, because it says clear, to just clear the information from my previous problem. And then my first coefficient for X is gonna be one. And then I have plus three X. So I'm gonna do three, enter and then minus, so I'm switching the plus to a minus 10 and press enter. And then to solve this, you would press the graph button and it gives us X equals two or negative five. So if you're not great at factoring, you could also solve for your X values using this method. It, does anybody need to see how to use PolySmelt using the TI-84 plus that is not CE? Just raise your hand if you need to see that. Everybody, okay, so I see a couple of hands. So I'm just gonna change my calculator to the TI-84 plus. So I would still press apps and then I would go down to PolySmelt 
always go too far here. Hopefully it didn't go too far already. Uh, let's see. I actually need to make this a little smaller so I can read it better. So we have Connex. There we go. So there's PolySmelt. And then I'm going to go to Poly Root Finder, which is my first option there. My order's two. I want real, Desi, normal flow degree. I'm going to press graph to go next, just like I did before. My first coefficient is A2, so that's just one. My second coefficient is the x coefficient, so that's just three. And my third coefficient is my constant, which is negative 10. So I just do that. And then I'm going to press graph to solve this. And it gives me x equals negative 5 or 2. So you could solve it either way in polysmelt. There's a third way that you could also use your calculator to solve this. You could graph x squared plus 3x minus 10. And then look at your x-intercepts in your graph to see what when does what is x equal to when y is zero. Goodness, that was hard to get out, but I did it. Okay, let's go on here. Let's look at test four number thirty-two, and I'm going to give you guys twenty seconds to solve this question. And you can send me the answer in the chat box once you have it. I already see one correct answer. Okay, first thing we would zoom in for this question and zooming in is actually the first concept on the core concepts for math. You wanna zoom in to find what the question is asking for and also see how does it relate to the core concepts. In general, SAT questions will relate to a core concept. So I am going to zoom in just on this equation and I can see that that equation looks an awful lot like y equals mx plus b. And they want to know by how many milliliters of mercury will the normal systolic blood pressure for an adult male increase? Is increase the slope or the y-intercept? Who knows? Is increase the slope or the y-intercept? It's the slope. And in this case, my slope is just one over two. So my slope is just one half or 0.5. And that's the answer here. Identifying y equals mx plus b on the S18 is critical. I hope if you learn at least one thing today, <laughs> that's your take home message. Let's look at number 30. And I am going to give you guys 30 seconds to answer number 30. Okay, so for number 30 here, I want you to remember for any kind of question that has a graph or a table, you must write on the graph, you must write on the table, and also remember that it's okay to ignore some information. You're not going to necessarily use 
everything that they give you for a question. So they say if k is a constant such that the equation f equals k has three real solutions, which of the following could be the value of k? So we need to translate f, f of x equals k and three real solutions to plain English. So plain English, I can't even say the word English today. So f of x equals k, is that going to be a horizontal or a vertical line? Who can tell me in the chat? f of x equals k, so y equals a number. Is that horizontal or vertical? It's horizontal, that's correct. So we are just gonna draw a horizontal line right above it to remind ourselves, hey, we're looking for a horizontal line. Then it says has three real solutions and real solutions when we're given an equation and then another equation would be our intersections. So how many times does this horizontal line um, intersect that equation? And they say it intersects three times. So I'm gonna draw a horizontal line and then I'm gonna move it around until it intersects three times with the line that's already there. And I can see at negative three, it intersects three times. At, so my answer here is just gonna be B. If I looked at answer choice A, which is positive two, it only intersects one time. So it can't be A. If I look at B, which is through zero, it only intersects one time. And at negative two, it only intersects one time. Notice here that we didn't need that equation at all. We didn't need it. We could ignore that information and we could just zoom in on the second part of the question, which is the part that actually matters in this case. Let's move on to number 27 from test six calculator section. In the xy plane, the graph of 2x squared minus 6x plus 2y squared plus 2y equals 45 is a circle. What is the radius of the circle? Everybody just put your hands down for a second because some hands are still up. And then we're going to re-raise our hands if you want to if you want the opportunity to attempt this question on your own before we look at it together. So if you wanna attempt this first on your own, raise your hand. Don't see that many hands raised. So we're just gonna look at this together to begin with. So without a calculator, we would need to complete the square in order to get that equation to look like our circle equation, which is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. And that is in the core concepts handout. So the first step of completing the square here is we need to divide everything by two. So we're gonna get x squared minus 3x, and I am going to separate that from y squared plus y equals 45. So half of negative 3 is negative 1.5, and negative 1.5 squared is 2.25. So because I'm adding 2.25 on the left hand of the equation here, I need to add it to the right hand side too. Half of one is 0.5 and 0.5 squared is 0.25. So I need to add 0.25 here. Remember that your equation is equal to R squared and 45, oh, I forgot to divide that by two. That's a silly mistake. This should just be 22.5, right? Um, 22.5 plus 2.25 plus 0.25 equals 25. So r squared equals 25, r equals five. You only really need to know how to do this without a calculator if you are aiming to score above a 700. If this seems really intimidating, let's raise our hands if this seemed really icky to you. 
and kind of intimidating. Yeah. You can use your calculator, which is why I love the TI-84 plus PE. And I'm just gonna show you how to do this problem. And this calculator for the sake of time will probably go a little bit over today because I do wanna look at a couple more questions, but I also want to be wise with the time that we have remaining. So I'm gonna switch my emulator here to the TI-84 plus CE. And I am going to go back to my home screen and we're just gonna go to our apps. So I'm gonna go apps and then go down to conics and circles. And the equation that they originally gave us was in the second form before we completed the square. So I'm gonna press enter there. My first coefficient was two. So I would put that in. My second coefficient was negative six. My third coefficient was um, two. And my constant would be negative 45. Note that the equation in the calculator is equal to zero. The equation on my piece of paper was equal to positive 45. I need to make what is on my paper match what is in my calculator, not the other way around. So I would subtract 45 from both sides of the equation. And that is why D, my constant, is equal to negative 45. The nice thing about using the Conex app is if you ever forget what to do, the Conex app actually tells you your options. So at the very top here, it says press alpha solve to solve this equation, or you can press graph. So if I press graph here, I would need to press the trace button, and then I could move it around and I could see what my smallest X value is and my biggest X value, and then figure out the diameter and divide by two. Well, that's kind of a lot of work. Instead, I'm gonna press alpha solve, which is the green button, alpha, and then enter to solve it. And it gives me my center and my radius. My radius is equal to five. And that's my answer here. So a lot faster and accurate also compared to completing the square. So I know some people may have to leave now because it's 7.30, I'm prepared to go over a little bit. Can you guys just raise your hands if you're okay with going over time today too, to look at some more math questions. So I just wanna see some hands if you're okay with that. So for those of you that maybe need to leave early, I'm just gonna launch a quick poll here. That's my wrap up poll. And if you guys, if everyone can just answer this now, we'll take like a mini, one minute, two minute mind break before we look at the rest of the questions. If you can just answer these. Oh, and I didn't press the launch button. You can respond to these questions and then we'll look at some more problems. I also have a course evaluation. Let me just pull that up or a workshop evaluation in this case. It's completely anonymous for the workshop evaluation. And if you don't have a pop-up, it may be a setting on your computer where you have pop-ups blocked. And unfortunately, I can't troubleshoot those during a workshop. So it would be something to just look into on your own before future workshops. So let's see here. Looks like the calculator or math workshops are the more popular choice so far. And then some of you are interested in the SAT prep course. I am offering one starting the first week of January. It will probably be the only course that I offer until next summer because I am currently pregnant and I am due mid-March. So that SAT prep course that starts the first week of January will most likely be the last course that I offer before the baby is due. 
if you are interested in the course, I am going, oh, thank you. I'm going to put the link here in the chat box and you can click on that. And then I'm also going to put the link, oh, I already did, added the link to the course evaluation. And I am going to end this poll and just share the results in case anyone's curious how other people insert these. And we'll move on to the next questions. Okay, so let's go back in here and we're gonna look at question number 30 from test six. I'm gonna stop sharing the poll. And I'm gonna give you guys just 20 seconds to answer question number 30 because realistically, that's how much time it should take you on test day to answer question number 30. Okay, so the first thing you should have done is thought of that you should write on the graph. All of the equations down here are in the y-intercept form of a parabola. So our graph, our little dots there, are probably going to form a parabola. And if I connect them, I'm going to get a parabola that opens down. This is a core concept for you to be able to identify when a core parabola opens down, the leading coefficient would be negative because it opens down. I think of it as an unhappy parabola. It's basically frowning. It's opening down. Think of it as an unhappy <laughs> smiley face here. So we want that negative leading coefficient. We're also going to look at our y-intercept because those equations are in the y-intercept form of a parabola and the SAT loves y-intercepts. And our y-intercept we can see is over here and it is positive. So we're looking for negative leading coefficient and a positive y-intercept. And that only occurs in answer choice D. And that would be our answer here. For number 30 from test nine, I am going to give you guys just 30 seconds to attempt it. And once you have an answer that you feel comfortable with, send it to me in the chat box. And someone asked about the link to the class recording. I will be sending that out in a follow-up email and this workshop was totally free. And the link to this recording will be most likely linked to YouTube. So you can watch it on there too. Okay, so what the College Board wants you to do here is find the slope of the equation of the line of best fit. So they want you to find this slope and then they want you to use y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, plugging in any two coordinates that are along that line and find the equation of the line and then pick an answer choice that best matches whatever equation you found. That takes a ton of work. Instead, on test day, before you go through all those steps, 
I want you to see what happens when you write on the graph and if it's possible to solve the question without diving deeply into algebra. So we're going to extend this line and see what the y-intercept is. But be careful, often where the line crosses the y-axis is not the y-intercept. Do you guys see how this is 10 there? That is not zero for x. So 402 is not the y-intercept. It cannot be answer choices A or B. Instead, what we're going to do is actually extend our x-axis right here. So this is going to be 8 and then 6, 4, 2, 0. And I'm going to extend that line even more and see that my y-intercept would actually occur all the way over there. And I don't know what number that is going to be for my y-intercept, but I do know that it's going to be less than 300. So it cannot be 300 here. My y-intercept is going to be smaller than 300. It's going to be 84. So the answer here is D. If you don't solve this question using this method by just writing on the graph and extending the line, you would have to go, and I'm just going to pull up the solution here, you would have to go through this whole process of picking two coordinates along the line of best fit, finding the slope, plugging that into y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 along with one of the coordinates along that line. And then your answer wouldn't exactly match one of the answer choices, but it would be close to one of them. So that's another way that you could solve this question. But I want you to strategize and solve these questions using the fastest way possible and not necessarily what you have relied on in the past. Let's look at number 36. And we looked at a similar one earlier, so you should all be pros at this and feel a little bit more comfortable at solving a question like it. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to attempt this question. And once you have the answer, you can send it to me in the chat box. So I see some answers so far. Okay, so let's look at this. So it says a system of equations above have no solutions. So you should have identified these as being in standard form, ax plus by equals c. And no solutions relates to a core concept. And let's just go look at it really quickly. It's on the back page. No solutions means that the lines are parallel, so they have the same slope. And interestingly, we're going to use the exact same method for this question type, whether it's no solution or infinitely many solutions. If A and B are constants, what is the value of A over B? So it is only interested in our slope here. It is not asking us about our y-intercepts. So we can cross those out. And I can see that A equals 3 fourths and B equals 1 half. So A over B would just be 3 fourths over 1 half. This is a calculator question, so you could just simply plug that 
into your calculator, or you could do this by hand and say three fourths times two over one. Remember when you're dividing by a fraction, you need to multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. So we'd have three times two is six over four, and that simplifies to three over two or 1.5. Either one of those would be accepted responses here. Some students get a little bit thrown off by the negative. Without going into too much detail for why the negative doesn't matter, um, this question is actually a free response question. It's not multiple choice, and it's not possible to have a negative answer to any free response question. So if that was something that concerned you for this question, just seeing that negative there and not knowing what to do with it, you can pretty much ignore the negative for a free response question relating to this question type. Okay, let's move on to number five from test 10 for the function f defined above. What is the value of f of negative one? And I'm going to give you guys just a couple seconds and a couple of you already have the right answer here. F of negative one is the same as asking you what is y equal to when x equals negative one. So we're going to take that negative one and we're just going to plug it in for x. So I can say that f of negative one equals negative one plus three over two which is two over two, which equals one. You could also solve this question by graphing x plus three over two, and then looking at your table to see what is y equal to when x equals negative one. You can also solve this question by going in your calculator and storing negative one as x. So I can say negative one, and then press the store button. So I'm gonna store it as X. And then I can go to math to the left one, get my fraction bars and just do X plus three over two. And it gives me that it equals one. I particularly like the storing feature in the calculator for more complex functions where you're maybe plugging in a negative number for x and you don't want to mix up um, your numbers or forget to, to distribute a negative or so forth. So that's number five. Let's look at number six. Which of the following is equivalent to that expression? And you should be able to answer that question pretty quickly. And we're almost at the finish line here. There's not that many more questions for us to look at today. And the rest of them are pretty quick. So I see a couple of right answers here. Whenever a question on the SAT asks me for an equivalent expression, I'm always going to just look at one term at a time instead of multiplying everything and taking the time to distribute everything. So I'm just gonna zoom in on my X squared term and see what is two X times negative three X. And that gives me negative six X squared and that negative six X squared only appears in one answer choice. So my answer here would have to be D for number six. Let's go on to number 11. And I think for the last couple of questions, because we're almost out of time, I am going to just show you quickly how to do them. And then if you want to reattempt them later on on your own, um, that would be OK, too. So they give us a table. The table above shows two lists of numbers, which of the following is a true statement comparing list A and list B. By a raise of hands, how many of you would feel comfortable finding the mean and the standard deviation in a graphing calculator? 
So I see one hand here. How about without a graphing calculator? So I see one hand. So the mean is just an average when you add up the numbers and you divide by how many there are. You could find the mean pretty easily without a calculator. For standard deviation, you're looking at the dispersal around the mean. When you have a different set of numbers and the spread is different, you are going to have different standard deviations. If I made a list of my list A numbers, or if I made a graph out of them, it would look something like this. I would just have one, two, three, four, five, six. But for my list B numbers, I would have them more clumped together because I have two of the fours. So that means my dispersal around the mean, and the mean is just the middle, would be different for these two. So the answer would be A without using a graphing calculator and just using logic. But that can be kind of difficult for students. And luckily, this question appears in the calculator section. So in the calculator, we're going to go, and my calculator is no longer turned on. Let me just turn that on here. One second to turn on. Oops. Okay. And it's going. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't want to turn on anymore. Let me see here. Okay, there we go. Sometimes computers can be confusing. So I'm going to go in the calculator and I'm going to press my stack button. And then I'm going to go to edit. Oh, but I have a problem here. Um, I have question or I have numbers here from this question when I did this previously. In this case, it's convenient, but what about if these numbers didn't match what I needed? If I try to press the clear button here, I'd run into difficulty. So I'm going to press second mode to quit out of that. And then I'm going to press second plus sign, and I'm going to clear all my lists so that I get a fresh start. So I'm going to press enter again, and now my lists are cleared. When I go to stat edit, I have a fresh start and that's how you get there. So I'm gonna enter in the numbers for list A, which is just one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I'm gonna enter in the list of numbers for list B in the second column. And that's two, three, three, four, four, five. And then I am going to press second mode. And the second step of using the stat button is pressing second stat. So I press second stat and then I'm going to go over to the math part and down to mean. So I want to find the mean of that list of numbers, but I need to tell my calculator which list. So I'm going to press second stat again and I'm going to insert list one and it gives me 3.5. Instead of going through the whole process to find the mean for the second list, I'm just gonna scroll up here and highlight mean of list one and press enter to copy it. And then I'm gonna to go to the left one and I'm gonna write over list one with list two. So I'm gonna go second stat and insert list two and it gives me 3.5. So I know that my means are the same. Let's check the standard deviations. So I'm going to press second stat scroll over to math, down to standard deviation, and then press second stat again, insert list one, and it gives me the standard deviation. And then I'm gonna scroll up, highlight that to copy it down, and press second stat to insert list two, and it gives me a different standard deviation from list one. So I know that the standard deviations are different. 
And remember that I will be uploading a recording of today's session. So if I'm going a little fast for the last couple of questions, you can always watch that recording back to review those. But I do know we need to wrap up here soon. We've got already gone a little bit over. So for number 12, it asks a book was on sale for 40% off its original price. 4% questions that relate to percent increase or decrease, we're going to use a core concept. And it's on the first page of core concepts, those two that I have start there. The first one is if we have increased by X percent, we're going to express the percent as a decimal and add it to the number one. If we have decreased by X percent, we're going to take that percent, express it as a decimal and subtract it from the number one. So for this particular question, we have percent decrease because we have 40% off. So we're going to say 1 minus 0.4, which is equal to 0.6. Now we're halfway there. They say if the sale price of the book was $18, what was the original price of the book? So we're going to say 0.6x or 60% of the original price is equal to 18, divide both sides by 0.6, and we get x equals 30. So our answer here is C. Okay, we're on the last page here our final frontier. For number 21, I'm going to show you a calculator trick. Who would know how to solve 21 in their calculators? And if you're curious about how to solve it without a calculator, um, if the algebra is challenging for you, just send me an email and I will send you the solution for without a calculator. I don't see any hands for with a calculator. So let's look at that. So we are given an equation there and it says Clayton will mix X milliliters of a 10% by mass saline solution with Y milliliters of a 20% by mass saline solution in order to create an 18% by mass saline solution. The equation above represents the situation. If Clayton uses 100 milliliters of the 20% by mass saline solution, how many milliliters of the 10% by mass saline solution must he use. Where should I plug in that 100? Should I plug it in for X or for Y? Where does that 100 go? Should it be plugged in for X or for Y? So they see 100 milliliters of the 20% by mass saline solution. And the 20% is that 0.2, which is next to the Y. So we want to plug in the 100 for Y. So we're going to get a new equation here that is 0.1x plus 0.2 times 100 equals 0.18 times x plus 100. And once you get to that point, you can go into your calculator. You do not have to solve this by hand and solve for X using algebra. We're going to go in our calculators and press the math button. And then we're going to go up one to numeric solver. And then the first box, we're going to put the left hand side of the equation, which is 0.1x plus 0.2 times, whoops, times 100. And in the second box, I'm going to put the right-hand side of that equation, which is 0.18, whoops, go back here, 0.18 times x plus 100. And once my equations match here, what was on my paper or each side of the equation, I'm going to press enter for OK. And then I'm going to press graph to solve this. So it gives me x equals 25. And that is my answer. So just remember that we pressed math and then went up one to equation solver. I need to share the right screen here. Here we go. So our answer here is just 25 based on what our calculator gave us. 
Number 23, I'm going to give you just 20 seconds to attempt 23 on your own. And once you have the answer, send it to me in the chat. So I can tell you that the College Board wants you to find the slope using two coordinates from the table and then use y minus y1 equals n times x minus x1, which is a lot of work and you don't need to do that in order to solve this question. So let's look at this. So for any table on the SAT, remember you wanna write on the table and they say, if there is a linear relationship, so that's just y equals mx plus b between x and y, which of the following equations represents the relationship? So the easiest part of this table to use will be the part that has the zero. So I'm gonna circle that part and I can see when x equals a, y equals zero, or when y equals zero, x equals a. So I'm gonna go through my answer choices here and I'm gonna make all those y zero because zero is by far the easiest number to plug in and see which one gives me x equal to a when I do that. So I'm gonna make all of these zero and I can see that only answer choice a has x equal to a when y equals zero. So it's all you need to do there to get to the right answer. Let's go on to number 25. How many of you would feel comfortable solving this question in the graphing calculator? See a raise of hands. How many of you need me to show you how to solve it in the TI-84 plus as well as plus CE? So raise your hand if you also need to see it in TI-84+. I don't think, okay, I do see a hand. So we have a system of equations here in standard form. AX plus BY equals C. And this question occurred in the calculator section of the SAT. So we can go to an app called PolySmelt and we're gonna use the second polysmelt. I don't know when my calculator keeps on disappearing today, but it does. Very strange. Let me just go grab my calculator and share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to go to apps and then go down to polysmelt, and we're gonna to go to simultaneous equation solver. Remember before we were using polynomial root finder. So we're going to simultaneous equation solver. I'm just gonna press enter. I have two equations and two unknowns, and then the rest I leave alone as just auto, normal, float, degree. To go next, I would press the graph button, and then you just fill in the coefficients for x and y. So you'd have 2.4. So I press 2.4 and then enter the minus sign and then enter 1.5 and enter 0.3 and enter 1.6 and enter and then 0.5 and enter and negative 1.3 and enter. And then you just press the graph button to solve this question and it gives you x equals negative 0.5. And see here, when I keep on pressing the graph button, it converts it between a fraction and a decimal. So that's how you use it. That's how you answer this question in the TI-84 plus CE. In the TI-84 plus, it's gonna look a little bit different. So let's look in there. So we're gonna go to apps and then go to poly, Smelt 2, just like we did before. So we're going to apps, 
and then we're going to go find poly smell two. And we're gonna to go to simultaneous equation solver. We have two equations, two unknowns. I'm gonna make the STESI normal flow degree, press graph for next. And here you just put in the coefficients and constants. It's as if the variables are there, they just don't show them to us. So you would put 2.4 as if it is 2.4x and then negative 1.5 y equals 0.3, 1.6 x plus 0.5 y equals negative 1.3. And then you would press graph to solve it and it also gives us x equals negative 0.5. Without a calculator, we would solve this using elimination. So on the SAT, elimination is by far going to be preferable compared to substitution 99% of the time. So they are asking me what is x equal to. So I would want to eliminate the y variables by multiplying the second equation by 3. And that would give me 4.8x plus 1.5y equals negative 3.9. And then I would just add those first two, the first equation and the last equation together. And it would give me 7.2x, my y's cancel. So 7.2x equals negative 3.6. I would divide both sides by 7.2 and it would give me x equals negative 0.5 as my final answer. So that would be without a graphing calculator. And then we're finally at the last question for today, number 34. The relationship between x and y can be written as y equals mx, where m is a constant. If y equals 17 when x equals a, what is the value of y when x equals 2a? And I am going to give you guys just 30 seconds to attempt this question. So Val, you're correct. So the fastest way to do this question is to write the equation that they gave us and just plug in the numbers. So we're going to say y equals mx. And they say if y equals 17, so you want to plug in 17 for y when x equals a. So we want to plug in a for x. So we're going to say 17 equals ma. What is the value of y when x equals 2a? So we're trying to find what y is equal to when we are plugging in 2a for x. Well, what did I need to multiply this a by to get 2a? I needed to multiply that by 2. In math, remember that whatever you do to one side of the equation, you have to do to the other side of the equation. So I need to multiply the left-hand side of the equation by 2 also. And that's going to give me 34 for y. So that's how we get 34 is what y is equal to when x equals 2a. Alternatively, we could have attempted to solve for a, so to speak. So we would have, or solved for the slope. So we would have said, so this would be our alternate method, that y equals mx. 17 equals ma, so m equals 17 over a. That is our slope. And then for the second part of the question, we would have said y equals mx, y equals 17 over a, and our x is 2a. Note here that I am just plugging in that 17 over a for my m because I found that m equals 17 over a. 
then I would have y equals 17 times 2, which is 34, and my a's cancel out. So I get the same answer, but I think the first way is a lot faster. So we're going to wrap up with that question. I'm going to share the course evaluation with you guys one more time. Evaluating these workshops really helps me out for planning future ones. So I'm just going to pull that up really quickly. If you take just a couple of minutes to fill it out, I would really appreciate it. And I always take your feedback into account when I'm planning future programs. I am hoping to offer at least one or two workshops in January with the Safety Harbor Public Library. And then I will probably take a break until next summer. Remember that I'm also offering the SAT Pro course. If you are interested in that, you can send me an email or check it out on my website. If it is unaffordable for you at the price point, just send me an email and let me know. I want it to be accessible to every student. Um, so that is it for today. You will see the link there for carlaberry.com slash evaluation to evaluate the program today. I appreciate every one of your participation. For those of you watching the recording back for the last couple of questions, I appreciate you too. Um, I will hopefully see many of you back tomorrow when we look at the evidence-based reading and writing and language sections of the SAT. I will keep my fingers crossed that we won't go over time again. We'll be a little bit better with time management, but I specifically picked the math questions that we looked at today because they are so important for your SAT success. And they're questions that relate to concepts that students often don't fully understand and where you could use strategies to really save time and make your lives a whole lot easier when you are trying to find the right answer. So make sure that you also practice these strategies on your own to reinforce them. So with that, I'm going to sign off for today. Let me know if you have any questions and I do appreciate you filling out that evaluation. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.